Like, people have a lot of guilt. You know, there, there's a line of social psychology that claims that most people feel that they're better than other people. And, like, I just don't buy that. That isn't what I've seen in my life. And maybe it's, I'm a bit biased because I'm a clinical psychologist and I see more people who are overtly suffering, maybe, than people do in general. Although I'm not so sure about that, you know, because you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface of most people's lives before you find something truly tragic. And, and I don't mean the sort of tragedy that, that you whine about. I mean, you know, your mother has Alzheimer's or, or your, your best friend committed suicide or you have a close relative with cancer or you have a sick child or, you know, there's something wrong with you because almost everyone has at least one really terrible thing wrong with them. And if you don't, hey, you will, so, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, so, so that, that, that tragic sense of being is there with people all the time. And, and, and it's also the case that, that my, in my experience, like, I rarely meet someone who says, hey, you know, I'm doing everything I possibly can, I'm a hell of a guy, and I can't see how I could possibly improve, you know? You, you, meet, you meet someone like that, you think they're narcissistic, right? And you're right. And, but, but most people don't feel that way. They feel like they could do a hell of a lot better than they are, and they're quite acutely aware of their faults, and they don't feel that they're what they should be. And you see, what happens in the story of Adam and Eve as well is that when people become self-conscious, at least that's how it looks to me, they get thrown out of paradise and then they're in history and history is a place where there's pain in childbirth and where you're dominated by your mate and where you have to toil like mad like no other animal because you're aware of the future you have to work and sacrifice the joys of the present for the future constantly and you know you're going to die and you have all that weight on you and to me again that's just how can anything be more true than that that's just as far as I can tell, that's just how it is, for, unless you're naive beyond comprehension. There's something about your life that, that, that is echoed in, in that representation. And why it is that, I mean, we're such strange creatures because we don't seem to really fit into being in some sense. And that's also what's expressed in the notion of the fall. We, the existentialist said, well, people feel like they have a, a debt that they have to pay off to existence for the, for the crime of their for the crime of their being, something like that. And, and maybe it's because we are acutely aware that we have to offer something of value to the people around us so that they can tolerate us, you know, while we're, we're going about our business. But it seems deeper than that is that human beings seem to exist in a post-cataclysmic world. And that's exactly also what's represented in Genesis. And it's very interesting because, you know, there's, in the Adam and Eve story, there's two there's two catastrophes, essentially. There's the catastrophe that occurs when Adam and Eve wake up, which we'll talk about in detail, and become self-conscious and, and know that they're naked. That, and, and, and their eyes are open, right? So that's the terminology that's used. And to have your eyes open means to have an, an increment in consciousness, essentially, because eyes are associated with consciousness for human beings because we're intensely visual animals. And so the metaphor of having your eyes opened means it's the same as the metaphor of coming to consciousness and as soon as Adam and Eve come to consciousness they realize they're naked and you know the classic interpretation of that is that it has something to do with sexual sin and I, I, don't, I don't believe that, I, I, I don't believe that that's what it means although, although there are elements about that that are relevant it's more that to realize that you're naked it's like, you're, you know, if, if you dream that you're naked and on a stage in front of people, that's not a sexual dream, man, unless you're some kind of strange exhibitionist, right? <laughs> it's, it's you want to cover yourself up and get the hell off that stage as fast as possible. And so to be naked in front of a crowd is to have everyone, it's to have the judgment of the social world focused on your self-evident inadequacies. And that makes people self-conscious, and that, that's a real human state. It's associated with neuroticism in, in the Big Five trait model. But people don't like that at all. They don't like having their fragility and vulnerability exposed to the group. It's one of the two major fears of people, because one is social humiliation, and the other is something like mortality and death. And like, <laughs> your, your typical agoraphobic, for example, gets to have both those fears at the same time, because she, it's usually a she, tends to believe she's going to have a very spectacular and exhibitionistic heart attack in a public place and make a terrible fool of herself while she's dying. So, and then that's a good example of, of the two archetypal fears that characterize, characterize human beings.